Dear students, I know you are running short of time. Here is a one-shot video where I have compiled all the poems and chapters that were available on our channel. Watch it till the end. Dear students, today I am here with the second poem of class 12th. The title of the poem is An Elementary School Classroom in a Slum Written by Stephen Spender in the days to come, you would be reading about Stephen Spender in the chapter Poets and Pancakes. In this poem, the poet describes the social inequality which are prevailing in the society. And through this poem, he describes the conditions of the students of an elementary school which is situated in a slum area. So the poet wants to draw the attention of each and everyone who reads the poem towards these kids so that their life can be improved and they can get trained to become good citizens so before i begin i would just request you to please subscribe the channel if you are new to the channel and if you like the content do not forget to give a thumbs up i would also uh, throw light on the title of the poem that is an elementary school classroom in a slum now what do you understand by an elementary school well an elementary school is basically the primary level school so today we are going to talk about a classroom from that elementary school that is up to the primary level and this school is situated in a slum. So we all know that the condition of a slum is not so good so the infrastructure of the school is also not up to the mark. So this poem is divided into four stanzas and the first stanza goes like this. Far, far from gusty waves, these children's faces, like rootless weeds, the hair was torn round their pallor. The tall girl with her weighed down head, the paper seeming boy with rat's eyes, the stunted, unlucky ire of twisted bones, reciting a father's gnarled disease, his lesson from his desk. At back of the dim class, one unnoted, sweet and young. His eyes live in a dream of squirrel's game in a tree room. Other than this. So here we see that the poet Stephen Spender visits a school in a slum area. And he's shocked to notice the measurable conditions of children studying there. Even the condition of the school was pitiable. Then he goes on depicting the picture of these children in vivid imagery, contrasting the rich world outside their slum. He says, these children are far, far away from the gusty waves, from the lap of nature, from the enjoyment of nature. By gusty waves, the poet symbolizes the bright, energetic side of life that is so lively and full of enjoyment. The word gusty means blowing strongly. But the poor children of the slum are far away from this bright, hopeful life of rich world that is situated outside their slum. In contrast, the slum children live a life of hopelessness. Their face is unkempt and dirty. Their hair is untidy, scattered around their pale faces. These children are compared to rootless weeds because weeds are unwanted wild plants that grow in the paddy fields. So these weeds are called rootless because they are not welcomed by us. And these children of slum are also like these weeds they are unwelcomed and unwanted by the rich world. They are pale because of malnutrition and unhealthy lifestyle. The poet perfectly compares the insecure life of the weeds to the insecure life of the slum children. Then the poet goes on describing the children present in the class. As we read, we'll see that the poet has introduced four students of that class to us in this particular stanza. So first, he talks about a girl who is tall and is sitting with her head bowed down. The poet perhaps tries to present the depressed girl with bowed down head because she was overloaded and overburdened with the difficulties and responsibilities of life. So she's exhausted and tired. She can't even sit straight because of the burden that she has. Then he mentions another boy and he is very light weighted just like a paper and because he is so malnutritioned that his eyes seem like rat small and scared and they are scared with the world outside so this boy is very weak and it seems as if he is in search of something maybe food, shelter or better life that he can't get there 
then the poet talks about a boy who is reciting a lesson from his book and he has a disease of twisted bones perhaps he is affected with some genetic disease that got it from his father so his growth is stunted means he is underdeveloped and at the same time he calls him the unlucky ayo because unlike other children he got nothing from his parents except for poverty struggle and the genetic disease that is carried on generation to generation the poet also says that there is a boy who's there present in that bim class but unlike the other children he lives in hope and dream he dreams of squirrel game in trees he dreams of nature life and energy and squirrel games here represent nature and life outside that classroom this unnoticed boy represents a ray of hope and life in that dark and dull classroom if we talk about the literary devices that the poet has used in this particular stanza the first literary device that the poet has used is repetition you can see it in the words far far from so the word far has been repeated here then the poet has used simile where the children are compared with rootless weeds and then the poet has also used metaphor when he's comparing a boy to the paper in the a phrase paper seeming boy rhyme scheme let me tell you there is no rhyme scheme used in the poem so this poem has been written in free verse let's now come to stanza 2 on sour cream balls donations shakespeare's head cloudless at dawn civilized dome riding all city belled flowery tyrolly's belly open handed map awarding the world its world and yet for these children these windows not this map their world where all their futures painted with a fog a narrow street sealed in with a lead sky far far from rivers capes and stars of words so here we see the unpleasant walls of the classroom which are decorated with the donations and picture of shakespeare the walls are called unpleasant because they are off white in color and show the decayed life of the slum and the picture of the shakespeare on the wall suggests the literate world outside as we know we are talking about an elementary school so there this picture of shakespeare has no sense because in elementary school or the primary level school shakespeare is not introduced then other pictures that hung on the wall include a picture of a clear sky at dawn flowery valley of austria along with the doom of an ancient civilization which represents hope enjoyment of nature's beauty and progress of human civilization the poet also says the rich people pretend to be generous to these people by donating such things to them but in reality there is no relevance of these things to the world of slum the children of the slum are limited to the world of their window to the world they see through the windows of the school classroom the future is foggy uncertain dull and bleak they are confined to the narrow streets of the slum enclosed by the polluted sky they are miles away from the rivers and seas that indicate the adventure and enjoyment of nature and they are also far from wisdom that can empower their future we also see that there is an image of a world map in the room but for these children the map of the world is irrelevant because the world in which they live is different from the world that is shown in the map so we see that the literary devices that the poet has used here are metaphor where the balls are compared to sour cream the poet says sour cream balls so here you see that the walls are described to be dull as sour cream then the future of the kids is described as limited with the usage of narrow streets sealed with a lead sky so here also the poet has used metaphor then we have assonance belled flowery tyrolese valley so here the sound of e is being repeated and then allusion that is reference to well known person or place so here shakespeare's head and tyrolese belly has been introduced so here the poet has used allusion then the repetition again has been used here with the word par being repeated then we come to the third stanza that says surely shakespeare is wicked the map a bad example with ships and sun and love tempting them to steal for lives that slyly turn in their crumpled holes from fog to endless nights 
On their slag heap, these children wear skins peeped through by bones and spectacles of steel with mended glass like bottled bits on stones. All of their time and space are foggy slum. So blot their maps with slums as big as doom. Here we see that the poet calls Shakespeare wicked because Shakespeare through his writing enlightened whole world. But unfortunately for these children, there is no hope of entering into that enlightened world. So the poet calls Shakespeare to be wicked. He also calls the map a bad example because that map does not hold any place for these slum children. They can just aspire to be there but cannot afford to live there. There is no means to go to that world. They are just cruel temptations for these children. They may steal or commit crime to achieve them. So they are called bad examples. These children's lives are confined to the narrow holes of that dark slum. Even their fate conspire them to be imprisoned there. They live lives of uncertainty since morning to night and their condition turns from bad to worst. The lives of these children are compared to the slag heap because they are like wastage of a refined, educated society that is dumped in garbage. Explaining their undernourished condition, the poet says their bones peep through their skin. That is, they are so skinny because of malnutrition that we can count their bones through their skin. They use spectacles not for luxury but because it's their necessity. They use mended glasses, cracked and steel framed because they cannot afford to buy brand new spectacles. So they manage with the repaired ones. They live a life of hell confined to their uncertain, unhealthy, polluted slum. They are like blot or stain in the progress of civilized life. As these slums are getting bigger, here the poet tries to explain that these kids have to face so many hardships in their lives. As these slums are getting bigger, they will destroy the future of these children and it is very difficult for such kids to escape from them. The literary devices that the poet has used here are first of all metaphor where the poet says cramped holes. So the homes of these children are compared to small holes. Then the poet has used simile where he says like bottle bits on stone. So he's talking about the repaired spectacles here. And then the poet has used alliteration in the phrase from fog where the sound of F is being repeated. The fourth stanza goes like this. Unless governor, inspector, visitor, this map becomes their window and these windows that shut upon their lives like catacombs. Break or oh break open till they break the town and show the children to green fields and make their world run azure on cold sands and let their tongues run naked into books, the white and green leaves open. History theirs whose language is the sun. So here, what do we see? So we see there is no coordination between the civilized world and the world of children in the school in a slum. So poet asked people from all sphere of life governor, inspector, teacher and visitor to come forward and educate these children so that they can fill the gap. These people must consider the lives of these children as their lives. Only then there can be a change. The slum is an enclosed space like internal part of a grave that is dark and suffocating. So the poet urged these people to break through the measurable and hopeless condition of these slum children and let them see green fields. They are asked to expose the slum children to nature and hope where they can breathe in open air that is unlimited just like rest of the world. He also asks them to educate and let open and go wild through pages of wisdom so that they can master them. He says one who can read and write only he creates history. Here, the poet wishes to break all kinds of social bonding and inequality to create a better world. So the poet has used metaphor here, wherein he says the white green leaves open. So he's talking about the books in nature expressed in form of white and green leaves. And then the poet uses anaphora. That is, uh, the words are repeated in two consecutive lines. So we have the word run being repeated run azure run naked right 
so anaphora has been used here then the poet has also uh, used simile wherein he says like catacomb so he is comparing the lives of these children to be living in a catacomb and then yes repetition has been used with the word break or break where emphasis is laid on the importance of helping these children break out of their confinement so we see that this poem ends on a note of positivity and the poet wants opportunities to be available to these children and today i'm here with the third poem of class 12th from the flamingo book the title of the poem is keeping quiet and the poet is pablo neruda in this poem pablo neruda discusses the need of maintaining peace and silence he stresses upon being quiet and harmless to the human beings animals and environment he also suggests that in order to maintain peace and harmony it is required to stop and introspect ourselves so this is a beautiful poem that will help us understand and introspect ourselves the first stanza of the poem goes like this now we will count to 12 and we will all keep still for once on the face of the earth let's not speak in any language let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much Here the poet asks everyone to count up to 12 in their mind. The number 12 represents the hours of the day or months of a year or it may also be the zodiac signs. He wants all of us to be calm and still. People across the nations have to unite together. So they shall not speak their own languages. Rather they all shall keep quiet and speak the language of silence. This will also bring unity among all the humans on the face of the earth. For at least one moment no one shall move his arms either to signal or to fight or argue with each other. So basically the poet is demanding peace from all of us. In this particular stanza the literary devices that the poet has used are assonance. So assonance is basically the repetition of vowel sound. So if you if you see this line now we will count to 12 not move our arms so much so here the sound of o and e is being repeated so here the poet has used assonance then the poet has also used anaphora anaphora is where two consecutive lines start with the same word so here we can see there are two lines that begin with the word let's then the poet has also used alliteration alliteration is repetition of consonant sound at the beginning of closely connected words so the words that are closely connected here and have the same sound a v well so the sound of w is being repeated talking about the rhyme scheme the poem doesn't follow any rhyme scheme the poem has been written in free verse let's move on to the second stanza it would be an exotic moment without rush without engines we would all be together in a sudden strangeness fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands the poet says that it would be a rare situation when there will be no engines working here he wants to say that if everything comes to a standstill it will be a very different moment if all the engines like the vehicles and the machines all over the world stop then there'll be a sudden strange situation as the world will experience a sudden calmness people will not be in a rush to achieve material things one after another further the poet says that the fishermen will also stop and not harm whales in the sea this means that the poet is urging everyone not to harm the animals Here he gives the example of whales which are being hunted for the purpose of food or trade. He gives an example of the man who gathers salt whose hands are hurt. Here he wants everyone to stop for a while in order to see and feel their achievements and how much they have lost for the sake of attaining such materialistic things. In this particular stanza there is only one literary device that the poet has used and that is alliteration we can observe it in the words we would where the sound of w is being repeated then we see sudden strangeness where s sound is being repeated and finally his hurt hands so the sound of h is being repeated here let's now move on to third stanza those who prepare green wars wars with gas wars with fire victory with no survivor 
would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. In this stanza, the poet asks everyone to stop those activities which are damaging the earth and environment. Today all the human beings are making money by damaging the environment with their activities such as mining, deforestation, letting the chemical waste into the rivers and many more. The poet asks us not to do so. He also requests people not to involve in wars as there is no benefit of achieving such victory in which no one is left alive. He says so because wars and environmental damage will lead to no life on earth. Rather, he wants people to adopt a new approach towards life and mankind. He says that you should treat your enemy like brothers and promote peace and harmony in the world. So the literary devices that the poet has used here are alliteration, wars with, so the sound of W is being repeated here and the second sound is of C in the words clean clothes. We also see the use of assonance where the poet has used the sound of vowel being repeated in the line victory with no survivors would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers. So the sound of O is constantly being repeated in these lines. We also have repetition being used here with the word war. The fourth stanza goes like this. If we were not so single minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could perhaps a huge silence might interrupt the sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Now we see that the poet wants to clarify to his readers that when he asks them to stop from saying or doing anything, he doesn't want anyone to become a non-active person. Why? Because non-active person is a person who remains idle and doesn't do anything. Here he simply means that we should stop and see the consequences of our deeds. The poet doesn't want to see people being killed due to their greed for money and expansion of territories. Further, he adds that people are continuously working to achieve their tasks without even thinking about their results. They are in fear of death and therefore want to achieve most of the things before they die. Here he urges the readers to stop for a while and take some moment to relish on what they have achieved till now. Everyone here is living a life in which he wants to achieve various things one after the other. But now the poet says it is the time to stop and see what has been achieved and should be enjoyed. This will help us skip the sadness which has become so prominent in our lives. The sadness of not enjoying what we have achieved and the greed to achieve what next is in the list to be achieved. The literary devices used here are alliteration in the word we were and that's the W sound and so single minded. So here we see the sound of S is being repeated. Then we also have enjambment here. Enjambment is when we move from one line to the other line without the usage of any punctuation mark. So we have an enjambment here where the third line is moving till the seventh line without any punctuation mark. Then we come to stanza 5 which reads, Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count up to 12 and you keep quiet and I'll go. Now the poet suggests to the human beings that we should learn a lesson from earth. During the winters everything freezes and becomes lifeless. But when season changes and it's the onset of spring season, trees, birds, rivers, everything gets life. So here the poet, by giving the example of nature, wants to say that all the human beings should stop and try to judge their deeds. They can try and make their life better with calmness and peace. Finally, he ends by saying that now he will count up to 12 so that we all may be quiet. Here quiet means to calm down ourselves and move towards the path of peace and harmony. After saying this, he says, I will go. Through this, he wants to convey the message to the people and wants them to be left alone to think about it and work in the direction of peace. So introspection is very important for a human being. 
Since my childhood I had heard my elders speaking a thing of beauty is joy forever and I actually was unable to comprehend what they mean to say Finally I came across this beautiful poem written by John Keats a thing of beauty and after reading this poem I finally got the answer of all my questions that were prevailing in my mind past so many years John Keats was born on 31st October 1795 and died on 23rd February 1821. He was one of the main figures of the second generation of romantic poets and along with him the other famous poets were Lord Byron and P.B. Shelley. Although his poems were not generally well received by critics during his lifetime, his reputation grew after his death. So by the end of 19th century he had become one of the most beloved of all the English poets. He had a significant influence on a diverse range of poets and writers. The poetry of Keats is characterized by sensual imagery, most notably in the series of odes. Today, his poems and letters are some of the most popular and most analyzed in English literature. His notable works are To Autumn, Ode to a Nightingale, On First Looking into Chapman's Homer, Ode on a Grecian Urn. There are many more because the list is never ending. He was a British romantic poet and his first epic poem that is Endymion was published in 1818. It is a narrative about relationship between a goddess and her human lover. The poem is based on the Greek myth of Endymion, the shepherd who falls in love with the moon goddess Selene, whom the poet renames Cynthia. And this extract, a thing of beauty, actually talks of how beautiful things give us pleasure and elevate suffering and sorrows. So the epic poem Endymion begins famously with the line, "A thing of beauty is a joy forever." Now let me begin with the explanation of the poem line by line. Line number 1 to 5 go like this. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases, it will never pass into nothingness, but will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. So in these lines the poet says that a thing of beauty can give us everlasting joy its loveliness never fades from our imagination rather it increases because our imagination keeps on adding new colors to it it never passes into nothingness it always remains fresh in our memory it serves the purpose of a quiet bower for us so bower is basically a shady place under the trees so The thing of beauty serves the purpose of a quiet bower for us and we can move into this bower whenever we like. In other words, in moments of sadness, we can recall the beauty of that object and be happy again. Its memory will lead us to a gentle sleep full of sweet dreams. It will keep us healthy and give us all peace that is required. Line number 6 to 13 go like this. Therefore, on every morrow are we reading a flowery band to bind us to the earth, spite of the spondence of the inhuman dearth of noble natures of the gloomy days of all the unhealthy and over darkened ways made for our searching. Yes, in spite of all, some shape of beauty moves away the pall from our dark spirits so here the poet says that it is beauty alone that keeps us going on this earth beauty is a kind of flowery band that binds us to this earth morrow is basically the next day after the present one that is tomorrow and reading means covering or surrounding So it is beauty that keeps us moving from one day to the next day. There is so much to grieve in the world, but beauty makes it possible to live here. There is depression and dejection all around. 
there are very few people who have a really noble heart man's life is all gloomy there are many mysterious happenings that men fails to understand in spite of all his attempts but in spite of all these unhappy things man continues to live on this earth and the poet says that it is only because there are some beautiful things also in the world it is the beauty of these objects that takes away the gloom from our sad hearts line number 13 to 19 go like this such the sun the moon trees old and young sprouting a shady boon from simple sheep and such are daffodils with the green world they live in and clear rills that for themselves a cooling covert make against the hot season the mid forest break rich with a sprinkling of fair musk rose blooms so here the poet list some of the beautiful things that add some charm to the otherwise sad life of this earth he says that there are the beautiful sun and the moon there are big and small trees that give pleasant shade to the gentle sheep and then there are lovely daffodils with all the green world in which they live there are clear streams that make cooling coverts along their course to protect themselves from the hot season then there are also low lying plants in the middle of the forest with the lovely white roses growing among them here and there and all these sights are so beautiful to look at so the last five line that are line number 20 to 24 say and such too is the grandeur of the dooms we have imagined for the mighty dead all lovely tales that we have heard or read an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from the heavens brink so continuing with his list of beautiful things the poet says that we imagine magnificent rewards by god on the day of judgment for those mighty men of the world who are now lying dead in their graves we think of those grand rewards and are filled with happiness then there are lovely tales of olden days that we have heard or read the poet calls all these beauties as endless fountain of immortal drink that heaven itself is pouring down for us in other words god himself has created these beautiful things for us so that we can derive joy from them during our life on this earth they can give us as much joy as angels derive from the immortal drink of heaven in today's video i'll be talking about aunt jennifer's tiger the poem has been taken from flamingo book of class 12th ncert aunt jennifer's tiger has been written by adrian rich she was an american poet essayist and feminist being feminist all her writing talked about females in this particular poem she expresses the inner feeling of a woman and that woman is aunt jennifer she usually talks about a woman's experience in her married life and she has tried to explore the inner feelings of a woman who is living under the dominance of men so the first stanza of the poem says aunt jennifer's tigers prance across the screen bright topaz denizens of a world of green they do not fear the men beneath the tree they pace in sleek chivalric certainty so in these lines the poet is describing a lady and this lady has been addressed as aunt jennifer by the poet so she says that this lady is embroidering a piece of cloth and she has designed this cloth with beautiful tigers and these tigers are running fearlessly in the green forest you'll see that the poet has described the beauty of the tigers to topaz topaz is a precious yellow colored stone so she says that the tiger 
when moves in the green forest it looks like a topaz she says that these tigers are fearless and they are not affected by the presence of men here we can see a contrast between the behaviors of the tigers that the aunt is embroidering and herself the tigers that she is designing are fearless but she herself is afraid of her husband further the poet says that these tigers are proud and fearless citizens of the forest they are so shiny and elegant and apart from that they display a chivalric trait that's a trait in a gentleman who shows special respect to women now let's move to the second stanza it says aunt jennifer's fingers fluttering through her wool find even the ivory needle hard to pull the massive weight of uncle's wedding band sits heavily upon aunt jennifer's hand so in this particular stanza the poet is talking about fingers of aunt jennifer the way they work on the embroidery and how they quiver and shake with the fear of her husband she's so scared that when she's embroidering her hands are shaking it seems that her husband is not happy with her hobby of embroidery therefore she trembles with fear while she's trying to embroider the piece of cloth you can see she's so scared that at times she finds it very difficult to pull her needle and then the poet talks about the wedding band that aunt jennifer is wearing and this wedding band was given to aunt jennifer by her husband on their wedding day so the poet says that this wedding ring is a kind of a burden for her she has been tortured by her husband to such an extent that the wedding ring which could have been a beautiful gift for her seems to be like a burden to her she has faced so many difficulties in her married life that the little ring is described as a heavy band on her trembling fingers this means that the ring is associated with some bad experiences in the form of torture she has faced because of her husband's dominating behavior the third stanza says when aunt is dead her terrified hands will lie still ringed with ordeals she was mastered by the tigers in the panel that she made will go on prancing proud and unafraid so here the poet says that one can easily sense aunt's desire for freedom but still she will not be able to attain freedom in her lifetime she will attain it only after her death but here also the irony of her life is that she will be tied up with the shackles in the form of her husband's wedding ring the ring was the sole proof of the tortures that she had faced from her husband so here we see that aunt is strangled with single wedding band that she is wearing in her finger whereas the tigers that she has designed are depicted with her desire to live a fearless life and these tigers are jumping proudly and bravely on the piece of cloth let me now throw some light on the literary devices used in the poem by the poetess the first is the rhyme scheme so the poet has used a beautiful rhyme scheme to make the poem rhythmic and that's a a b b the second literary device that the poet has used is anaphora anaphora is use of same words in two consecutive lines so you see the line they do not and they pace in so the word they is being repeated then we have metaphor where the poet has compared the yellow colored tigers to topaz so this is metaphor and then we have alliteration where you see the line finger fluttering so the sound of f is being repeated here so we have alliteration we also have alliteration in the last line of the poem prancing proud so the sound of p is being repeated here 
Dear students, today I am here with the summary of the chapter, the last lesson taken from Flamingo book of class 12. Let's listen to the summary carefully. Franz was a young boy in the district of Alsace which had been occupied by the Germans during the Franco-Persian War of 1870-71. One morning, Franz walked reluctantly towards school as he had failed to learn the grammar lesson assigned by his teacher M. Hamel. The fear of punishment brought wavered ideas to his mind. He thought of escaping school and spending his day in the company of nature. However, he resisted all temptations and proceeded gradually, hoping to escape his teacher's attention amidst the usual hustle-bustle of early hours at school. Before reaching his destination, he passed the town hall where he saw a great rush of people in front of the bulletin board. As an inhabitant from a war-torn area, he knew that there must be yet another dreadful message posted on the board. But he wondered what it could be. On reaching school, he witnessed an unusual calm. The class was occupied by the villagers along with the regular students. Surprisingly, their teacher, M. Hamel, dressed in his Sunday best, did not reprimand Franz for being late. Instead, he asked him solemnly to be seated. The reason for the unusual happenings of this day dawned upon Franz when his teacher announced that it would be their last French lesson because the Persians had passed an order that sought to replace the teaching of French with German. This news sounded like a disaster. M. Hamel, however, did not let the spirits to dampen and began the last lesson with full enthusiasm. Franz was asked to recite the rules of participles, which he fumbled with as he had not revised properly. He repented his casual attitude towards his own mother tongue and now the fear of losing the opportunity to master his native language spelled like doom to him. But contrary to the routine days, M. Hamel did not scold Franz. He expressed deep worry about the human tendency to take things for granted. He held everyone, including himself, responsible for the failure to learn French. However, like a true spirited teacher, he devoted the entire last lesson to pass on to the students his knowledge as best as he could. He praised the French language as the most beautiful in the world and asked his students to guard it always. He explained the lesson with patience and gave new copies to the students with Franz Alsace, written in beautiful handwriting on them. The students too exhibited rare attention and tried to learn all that the teacher taught on that day. Towards the end of the lesson, the teacher and his students, both young and old, were overwhelmed with emotions. M. Hamel signed off his last lesson by writing in big letters the message Long Live France on the board. And today I am here with the chapter The Rat Trap taken from the Flamingo book of class 12th. This story has been written by a Swedish writer Selma Legelov. It is about a poor wanderer who used to make his living by selling rat traps made out of begged materials. He also took to petty stealing at times as selling rat traps alone was not enough to sustain him. When lonely, a somber thought often crossed his mind and uh, he felt that all the comforts of life were nothing but baits set to trap human beings. Thus he found the world to be similar to a rat trap where men and women succumbed to temptation. One day, as he moved door to door selling his rat traps, he reached a small grey cottage and sought shelter from the owner who lived alone. This man had been a crofter who worked at Ramsjo Iron Works. Now, who's a crofter? A crofter is a person in Scotland who rents or owns a small farm adjoining a house. So, he was extremely kind to the peddler and he not only fed him porridge, but the two also smoked together and played cards. The crofter was so pleased to have a guest that he disclosed his source of income to the stranger. And he also showed him the 30 coronas that he had got after selling his cow's milk to the creamery and had kept it in a pouch that hung on a nail near the window frame. 
krona is a unit of money that is used in Sweden. The next morning, the red trap seller took leave of his host but returned half an hour later, smashed the window pane and stole the money that the crofter had shown him the previous evening. He took to the road into the woods to avoid getting caught. He walked quite long and then got confused by the maze of forest paths. Dead, tired and hungry, he realized that he had fallen into a trap. Suddenly, he heard a regular thumping of the hammer and realized that he was near some iron mill. He gathered strength and walked in the direction of the sound to finally reach the Ramsjo ironworks. He sneaked into the mill and entered the forge. Forge is the blacksmith's workshop. Okay. The man agreed but rather coldly. Still, the peddler went close to the furnace to warm himself and laid down to sleep. The owner of this mill was a prominent iron master whose ambition was to ship out good iron. Hence, he would visit his workers regularly to inspect their work. He came to the mill that night as well and the rat trap seller's presence caught his attention and he moved closer only to mistake him for his old regimental comrade, Captain Nils Olof. Overwhelmed to meet his old acquaintance and saddened by his pitiable condition, the mill owner insisted the rat trap seller to accompany him to his manor house. The peddler did not reveal his true identity but refused to go with the iron master. After failing to convince the peddler to be his Christmas guest, the iron master left the mill. But within half an hour, his daughter, Edla Wilmanson, arrived and invited the peddler once again. She assured him that he could leave any time after Christmas. The peddler changed his mind and accompanied the young girl to their manor house. On the way, he felt as if he had fallen into the trap from which he would never be released. On reaching the manor house, he was accorded a warm welcome. He was given a shave, a refreshing bath and change of clothes. After this transformation, he was presented before the Iron Master who realized that he had mistaken this man for his old comrade. Upset by the peddler's pretense, the Iron Master threatened to hand him over to the sheriff. However, the peddler insisted that he had never claimed to be the comrade that he was thought to be. On the contrary, it was the Iron Master who had refused to listen to him. At this point, Edla intervened and said that in spite of the misunderstanding, she wanted the man to stay with them for Christmas. Her father gave in to her wish and this unknown guest was given a hospitable stay. He was invited to the feast and other celebrations over the evening. He slept like a log in between the festivities. The Christmas Eve passed peacefully and Edla and her father left for the church in the morning, leaving behind their sleeping guest. On reaching the church, they heard about the theft at the crofters and realized that the thief's description fitted their guests. Worried and upset, they returned home thinking that their precious silverware too must have been stolen by now. However, when they reached the menor, they were informed by their valet that the guest had left without taking anything with him. Rather, he had left behind a parcel for Edla. She curiously opened the ill-packed gift to find a rat trap and the three ten kroners notes wrapped in it. A note accompanied this gift with the request for Edla to return the money to its owner. The peddler had expressed gratitude to the girl for treating him like a true captain. The humane treatment by the gentlewoman had aroused the conscience of this tramp and he had made an effort to rise from his befallen state by returning the stolen money. You and today I am here with the chapter Indigo taken from the Flamingo book of class 12th. So uh, this story is basically an excerpt taken from Louis Fisher's book. The title of the book is The Life of Mahatma Gandhi and uh, this is an excellent book that contains a first hand account of British high handedness and oppressive policies. And these policies led to the involvement of the masses in the freedom movement. In this chapter, we see that Gandhiji's decision to seek the ouster of the British regime from India was affected by an incident that took place in 1917. So in December 1916, Gandhiji had gone to Lucknow in order to attend the annual conference of the Indian National Congress. Here he happened to meet Rajkumar Shukla who was a poor farmer from Champaran. 
Rajkumar Shukla approached Gandhi ji and requested him to visit his place to see the plight of the indigo planters. Gandhi ji had prior commitments and he could not go with Shukla. But the indigo cropper was so persistent that he stayed with Gandhi ji and kept following him wherever he went. Finally Gandhi ji decided to accompany him to Champaran. Both of them reached Patna and stayed for one night at the house of Rajendra Prasad and Rajendra Prasad was none other but the one who became the president of India then they moved to Muzaffarpur and there professor J B Kriplani and his students came to receive them at the station Gandhi ji stayed at the house of professor Malkani who was a government school teacher Now this was something unusual because government employees would usually stay away from the congressmen because they worked for the British government. By this time the news about Gandhi ji's arrival had spread and peasants reached Muzaffarpur with the hope of a solution to their plight. Now let's see why the farmers were so disturbed and uh, why were they facing this plight. Actually in Champaran the tenants that is the farmers were compelled to grow indigo in 15% of their land and this crop was taken by the britishers as rent by this time germans had developed synthetic indigo now the british land owners knew that they could no longer continue making profits via you know the crop of indigo so in an attempt to squeeze out the last profit they began to charge compensation for releasing the farmers from the arrangement of this forceful planting of indigo now some of the peasants had signed the agreement because they were unaware about the synthetic indigo but when farmers came to know about synthetic indigo they sought the legal course to retrieve the compensation money So Gandhi ji tried to analyze the situation by talking to the lawyers who were representing the case of the peasants. During the course of conversation he discovered that the lawyers had been charging high fees from the peasants. Gandhi ji scolded the lawyers on knowing about it and decided to change the course of action because he did not expect justice from the law courts that were being run by the British. He then resolved to free the people of fear from the ruler. Gandhi ji arrived in Champaran and asked the secretary of British Landlords Association for details but the secretary refused on the grounds that he was an outsider and Gandhi ji claimed that he was not an outsider because this was his country after this Gandhi ji tried to contact the administrative officials of Tirhat who declined any help and advised him to leave the town at once instead of leaving the town Gandhi ji left for Motihari that is the capital of Champaran along with several prominent indian lawyers crowds of peasants greeted them at the station Gandhi ji began investigations to understand deeply this system of exploitation of ignorant farmers during one of his visits to an affected farmer he was stopped on his way and was driven back to town after that an official notice was served ordering him to leave champaran gandhi ji signed the notice but put a remark that he would disobey it subsequently he was summoned to appear in the court the next day gandhi ji stayed awake the whole night and made preparations before appearing at the court the news about this trouble had spread past and thousands of peasants gathered around the court the officials had to seek gandhi ji's help to control these men as a result of this mass unrest the authorities postponed the trial in turn gandhi ji protested against the delay and read out a statement admitting that he disobeyed the law but also emphasized that the voice of his conscience held greater value than the law the judge decided to release gandhi ji but asked him to furnish bail for the 2 hours recess before the judgment was pronounced gandhi ji refused again the judgment was withheld for a few days but gandhi ji was allowed to stay free the lawyers who had come for the trial had no choice but to return however they decided to court arrest as per gandhi ji's wish thus registering their fight against the injustice meted out to the share croppers this marked the beginning of the victory of the battle of champaran gandhi ji's principle of civil disobedience had proved successful the lieutenant governor dropped the case against gandhi ji however a defiant gandhi ji did not leave champaran and went ahead to inquire further into the grievances of the farmers 
about 10,000 testimonies were recorded. Gandhiji was again summoned by the Lieutenant Governor because the civil disobedience launched by him had set the stage for greater trouble. Finally, a commission of inquiry was appointed in which Gandhiji represented the peasants. The British landlords were left with no choice and they had to agree to refund the money. Gandhiji agreed to a refund of 25% of the original amount because this was signatory of the victory of the suppressed as well as the surrender of the British. Gandhiji did not stop at this political victory because his real aim was the social and cultural upliftment of Champaran. He initiated a campaign of social welfare by setting up schools and health centers. His wife and youngest son, along with many volunteers, joined him in this task. Thus, a brief visit to a remote district was extended for more than a year and this experience marked a turning point in the life of Gandhiji. His unconventional ways of politics became apparent because his focus remained on the common man's everyday problems seeking liberation through self-reliance. Dear students, today I am here with the chapter the third level taken from the Vistas book of class 12th. So the story is basically a science fiction as it will leave you with a lot of unanswered questions and we'll come to those questions in the end. So before I begin, let me introduce the main characters to you. So the first character is Charlie, who is an ordinary person who likes to collect stamps, desires a peaceful life and goes to work like any regular person. Then we have the second character who is Louisa and she's Charlie's wife. The third character in the story is Sam who is Charlie's friend. At the same time he is a psychiatrist as well. Sam plays an important role in the story and adds a dimension to the story which justifies it to be a science fiction. So the story starts with Charlie trying to establish the fact that all presidents could swear that there are only two levels in the Grand Central Station. So Grand Central Station is the main station in New York City. Charlie believes that he had actually gone to the third level and since it was non-existent, he decided to consult Sam who was his psychiatrist friend. Sam blamed it on his desire to escape from the tensions and pressures of life. Even some other friends thought that his habit of collecting stamps hinted upon the same habit of escapism. Though Charlie didn't agree with the logic as even his grandfather used to collect stamps. Moreover, he was not trying to escape as there was no pressure in his life when he started collecting stamps. Then he goes on the explanation as to how one evening when he was in a hurry to reach home, he took one wrong turn which he was unaware of earlier and that's how he reached the third level. Here, he noticed many things which assured him that he had reached the year 1894. So, when he observed, he started to look at the differences that he could visualize on the third level. He saw that the room was smaller here and it had fewer ticket windows and the train gates and the information booth were all old style. He also noticed a lot of difference in their dressing style. The dressing style was quite old. Then he also spotted spittoons on the floor and even the lights were open flame gas lights. The clue which thoroughly established the existence of the fact was the newspaper. So the name of the newspaper was The World which was not being published now. And this newspaper had some news about President Cleveland. This was later corroborated by Charlie when he returned to the present world and had found the same newspaper in the library but the date was June 11, 1894. Even the currency that was used was old style and when Charlie was trying to buy the ticket, he had to make escape because the clerk thought that he was a swindler who was cheating by giving some fake currency. 
it was during this escape that he was so convinced that the third level existed he even bought old style currencies and paid a premium amount for it that's extra money to buy something which is vintage and has a lot of value with his saving he had around 300 dollars as a saving but he finally managed to get somewhere less than 200 dollars but he was happy with it because 1894 there was a time when the cost of living was very very low after procuring the money he tried to find the third level but he couldn't find it and on his wife's insistence he gave up the idea altogether but before we go any further we must understand the concept of the first day cover now what is the first day cover it is actually an envelope which a stamp collector posts to himself so that he can get his new stamp and add it to his collection so what the person does is the person puts a blank paper into that envelope and posts that envelope with the new stamp on it to his own self now that you know the meaning of the first day cover you will be able to understand that how charlie was convinced of the existence of the third level One day while he was going through the collection and he chanced upon a letter he hadn't seen earlier. So he opened the envelope and found a letter from his friend Sam who was even his psychiatrist. He had written in that letter that he had found the third level and was living in Galesburg, Illinois in 1894. He had even asked Charlie and Louisa to continue to look for the third level as life was very pleasant out there. and today i'm here with the chapter evans tries an o level let's begin with the summary in early march the governor of oxford prison arranged for evans a thief to take the o level german exam in his cell with a person acting as invigilator evans had escaped thrice from prison in the past The governor resolved that Evans would not escape from his prison. He took all possible precautions including bugging Evans's cell. The evening before the exam, Evans's German tutor wished him luck in German. It was evident that Evans knew no German at all. On the day of the exam, Evans's cell was checked thoroughly to ensure there was nothing he could use to escape. The governor switched on the receiver for the hidden microphone a few minutes before the exam was supposed to start. He felt quite sure that there was no scope for an escape, but suddenly wondered if McLeary, the invigilator, could unknowingly help Evans escape. On the governor's instruction, Jackson, the senior prison guard, searched McLeary thoroughly. He took away only a paper knife from McLeary's suitcase. The governor then heard McLeary giving Evans exam instructions. He also heard Evans protesting the presence of a prison guard, Stephens, in the cell and instructed Stephens to remain outside the cell. The exam finally began. Stephens kept a close watch and peeped in from time to time. In some time a call came through from the examinations board regarding a correction in the paper. The governor was suspicious and called back to check but the line seemed busy. After a while the governor heard Evans ask permission to wrap a blanket around his shoulder. Stephen who looked In a minute later wondered if he should report this but decided against it. A few minutes before the end of the exam, Stephens received instructions to escort McLeary out of the gates himself once the exam ended. After seeing McLeary off the premises, Stephens decided to check on Evans one last time. He was shocked to find McLeary sprawled in Evans's chair. blood flowing down his face Stephen shouted for Jackson McLeary his face contorted with pain told them that he knew where Evans had gone 
he thrust the question paper into the governor's hand. The last page had instructions in German which the governor managed to translate. The injured McLeary was sent off in the police car that had arrived since only he seemed to know where Evans was. The furious governor realized that someone had called Stephen impersonating him. He decoded the name Newbury from the question paper and understood Evans's plan. He issued instructions to Jackson, St Stephens and the police inspector of the locality. Just then the governor received information that Evans had escaped the first police car. The governor however calmly told the policeman to reach Newbury. He inquired about McLeary and was informed that an ambulance had been arranged to take McLeary from the examination offices to Redcliffe Hospital. The governor rang the hospital asking for McLeary. The hospital replied that there had been no one to pick up. Suddenly the truth hit the governor. The police found the real McLeary tied up in his room. No one was found in Newbury. Everyone realized that Evans had not escaped as McLeary but had stayed inside as McLeary. In the meantime, Evans had checked into a hotel and was enjoying his freedom. When he returned to his room after a stroll, he found the governor seated on his bed. The governor had deduced Evans's hiding place from the correction slip and McLeary's exam instructions which were actually map coordinates. Evans revealed how everything was planned, right down to the correction slip, the phone call impersonating the governor and the blood. The governor wondered how Evans had planned all this without communicating with his friends. Evans explained that the German tutor was his friend. A prison officer handcuffed Evans and led him to the prison van. As the van turned to the main road, the guard in the van suddenly unlocked Evans's handcuffs and urged the driver to hurry before the governor realized something was wrong. Evans suggested Newbury as the van sped away. That's all for today. In case of any doubts or queries, you can drop us a message on Instagram or you can also drop them in the comment section below. I'll revert to them as soon as possible. See you in the next video. Till then, bye-bye.